Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Vandermolen, and I'm the ministry director and online venue pastor here at the Foundry Church. And I'm so excited that you are joining us for worship. And I'm currently standing out in our main causeway here at the Foundry. And I just want to show you an activity that we have going on here. Um, in this summer series, we are talking about intersections and different Bible characters and when they intersected or crossed paths with Jesus and what we can learn about Jesus' character based on those intersections. And so this activity up here, we have little flags that we are placing on the places where people in our Foundry community um, lives intersected with Jesus's. So um, I'd encourage you to be a part of this. We'd love for you to be a part of this activity. So in the chat bar, I encourage you just to uh, type in that place where your life intersected with Jesus's, or if you prefer, you can send me an email online at foundrychurch.net, and I'll make sure that your, your flag or your pin gets up here on our map. Here at the Foundry Church, we believe in transformation, and one way that transformation happens is by being in the Word of God. So that's why we created these. Foundry Devotionals. These are created by our amazing team of writers, and this one contains the whole book of Proverbs and is a 365-day devotional that will take you um, through the book of Proverbs and will encourage and challenge you to grow in your faith. And this pamphlet was created for the series that we're in right now called Intersections. It will take you deeper into the message um, that the pastor will be talking about each Sunday. So I encourage you, if you have not done so already, to pick one up, um, or both of them up. You can come anytime to the West Doors in the airlock. You can pick up a hard copy there. Um, you can go online to our website, foundrychurch.net, scroll down, and you'll find an electronic copy. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and would like a hard copy, send me an email online at foundrychurch.net, and I'll make sure one gets shipped out to you. I want to say thank you for your generosity with your offerings and God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry Church, there's a couple different ways you can do so. You can go online to our website, foundrychurch.net, click the Give tab and follow the instructions, or if you prefer, you can mail us your offering. The address of our church is up on the screen right now. Um, and I also just want to share with you this morning that we are looking forward to our next Summer Nights event. Um, as you know, the first one got canceled because of rain, but this next one is going to be great. We're super excited. We're gearing up with all the details and figuring out what that's going to look like. But that's going to be taking place on Saturday, July 24, here at the Foundry Church. Um, so put it on your calendar, and as the details come out, we'll begin to share more and more of that with you. But that's Saturday, July 24, here at the Foundry Church, and it's going to be Saturday evening, so mark that down. And I'm so excited to introduce to you this morning the two newest members of our Foundry community. And really, just this year, we've had so many new babies here at the Foundry that we're just so excited to celebrate and just see what God has planned um, for all of them. So the two newest new members, the two newest members of our Foundry community are Palmer James Vinspiker, born to Jake and Sydney Vinspiker, and Desmond Newhouse, who's born to Tucker and Sharon um, Newhouse. So I just encourage you to reach out to these families, come around them as they adjust to life with the newest member of their families, and just be praying for them as they, as they make this transition. All right, that's all the announcements I have for you this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We just thank you that we get to gather and that we get to worship you in this space or wherever we are worshiping this morning, God. Um, we just want to give you all glory and all praise um, because you are the almighty God, the ruler over all of creation. And we thank you for that. Lord, I'm thankful for the two newest members of our Foundry community. Um, Lord, I just pray um, your blessing upon their families as they raise these children to become um, men with hearts after you. And I just pray that you give them wisdom in that, Lord. And I pray too, uh, this morning, as we hear the message from Pastor Bob, I just pray that you would be with him, that you'd give him peace as he speaks this morning and that you would, uh, uh, may the words that he say, may they be representative of you. And I pray that we'd have open hearts to receive what it is that you have for us this morning. Lord, we love you so much. You are good. In Jesus' name, amen.
What's that? You need a ride? How about you call Eric's Uber Incorporated? Yeah. 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 So you're pretty quiet. I don't know if you're aware about this, but uh, you get a two for one on this. You get a free conversation and I'll take you to your destination. So you pay people to talk to you. Actually, they pay me. Well, wait, actually it's free. Sorry, I'm just I'm a little edgy today. I'm so frustrated with my sister. I've been praying for her for years and nothing. I've tried everything. You know, she was doing really good at one point. She was even living with us. She wasn't drinking. I thought, you know, she was ready to come to church with me and meet Jesus. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you were getting her ready to meet Jesus? Didn't want her all messy at church, you know? <gasps> Whoa, who are you? When did you get here? Oh, sorry, I was just napping. I have had a terrible journey. I have been shipwrecked, beaten, put in jail, bitten by snakes. It's okay. Paul, this is Danielle. Danielle, this is the Apostle Paul. He knows a thing or two about whether or not someone needs to be ready to meet Jesus, and he knows a lot about unanswered prayer. If you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This morning we are in a series called Intersections, and we've been looking at the times Jesus has intersected the life of people in the scriptures, and he often answered some of their deepest questions that they had about faith. And we've looked at people like Philip and Nicodemus and Mary and Paul, 
And this morning we're continuing to look at when Jesus intersects the life of a guy named Paul and answers this big question, why hasn't he answered my prayer? That's a very complex and nuanced question. Why hasn't God answered me? So to begin the discussion today, I have a question of my own I'd like to ask you. And the question helps us get to this bigger question here. Why hasn't God answered my prayer? And it's a poorly worded question, but it is my own question. And the question is simply this. What happens when you don't win? What happens when things don't go your way? What happens when you have it planned out and it doesn't work out? What happens when you don't win? The first example or first memory I have of not winning came when I was young. When I was little, I used to play soccer, and I played till I was big. And uh, I remember in a tournament game, we were playing, and we were tied. And the game ended, but you can't end in a tie, so we went to a shootout. And they take five people from one team and five people from the other team, and you each kick goal kicks with a goalie trying to stop you. And the person who scores the most of those five wins the game, and I was shooting fifth. I was the most pressure on me I had was shooting fifth and the score was tied and I remember coming up the line and if I kicked it in we won and I looked at the ball and I looked at the goalie and I squinted gave like my Clint Eastwood thousand yard stare and I looked at the ball and I approached the ball and I kicked beautifully hit it and the ball curved and it went past the goalkeeper who was a girl but that doesn't matter and <laughs> And in the goal, and we won, and I put my finger up. We're number one, and people ran out and lifted me on their shoulders, and there was a parade and confetti and champagne from the heavens. And not all that happened, but some of it did. Now, fast forward a couple weeks. We're still in the tournament, and the game ends in a tie. And this time, I'm still shooting fifth. But as we get to me shooting now, instead of me having to kick it in to win, I need to kick it in to tie the game to go into another shootout. And so I approach the ball just like I did last time with the squint and the stare. And I look at it and I go and I stumble when I kick and I hit the ground and the ball barely slowly rolls and the keeper swatted it away and we lost. And it was, oh, I was just horrible. I still carry like the baggage now I have of losing this game. And I remember walking to the bench and Josh, one of my teammates, is like, nice shot, Bob. I was like, shut up jerk like so, so hard and so much anger and so many things I was going through and my dad said to me after the game I, I, I'll never forget this he said son it takes a better man to lose than it does to win and I was thinking well I don't I don't really need to be the better man right now I, I, I'm fine with just winning but what he was saying to me was really a simple truth it takes more character it takes more resolve to go through things and go through things in a mature manner when you don't win, when it's not going your way, than it does when you always have things go your way. We ask this question, what happens when you don't win? How do you deal with that? Maybe not in sports, but like in life. How about the high school student who's in here? Who has everything planned out, where they want to go, what they want to do, what they're going to study, the school they're choosing, what their internship's going to be, what it's going to mean for their life. They have it all mapped out, and they get the letter back from the school, and the school says, we're sorry to inform you, but not here. You're not accepted. What do you do with that? What do you do when you don't win? What about the young couple that's been married for a while, and their dream is to have a family of their own, and they can't seem to be getting pregnant, and they go to the doctor, and one day they find out that dream that they had probably will never happen and won't be able to have a family of their own. What do you do with that? What about the person that's gone to work 15 years, loves their job, goes there faithfully, and one morning is called into an office and told, we're sorry to inform you, we have to let you go along with 200 other people. There's been cutbacks. How do you deal with times like that when you don't win? What about not even that? Let's just push it even farther, even spiritually. What do you do when we ask that question, when God 
doesn't answer your prayers? Why hasn't he answered my prayer? How do you deal with that spiritually? Do you get mad? Do you get upset? Do you blame God? Do you blame yourself? I've seen God answer amazing things, and I've seen God be silent before, and sometimes it can do incredible things for people of faith, and sometimes it can completely derail people. What happens when God doesn't answer your prayers? That's what we want to look at. And this happened to a guy named Paul, and Jesus intersects his life and teaches him a very important truth. And that's what we want to look at this morning. We want to look at this guy named Paul and what Jesus teaches him about what happens when God doesn't answer or answer the way we want. But before we get there um, and before we get to this, you need to know a little bit a background about this guy named Paul in the book of Corinth because the text itself is a little bit different. It's a little strange and you won't really get what they're talking about unless you know the background. So a couple minutes I'm going to spend on Paul and the background of this church so that you understand what he's writing about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So bear with me for just a second. This is a picture of Paul. Apparently he's bald and has a beard. We don't really know a lot about him other than his name was Saul He was born in Tarsus, which is in modern-day Turkey near Syria. And Pastor Matt talked about some of his life and his upbringing last week. You need to listen to it about his Damascus stuff. But the things we know about Paul, and he writes about his background, one of the things is found in uh, Philippians chapter 3. He said this about himself. He said, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, I'm faultless. And Matt had talked about this, that Paul, or originally Saul, became a Pharisee. He became an expert in Jewish law. And he went from place to place, town to town, synagogue, and he became well known for how well he knew the law. And one thing he did was he protected the Jewish faith and he would fight off any sort of religion that was false. And there was a group of people that were believing this person, Jesus, was the Messiah. And so he went from place to place persecuting these people. That's what Paul or Saul was known for. And then he has this trip he's taking to Damascus as Matt talked about last week and there's a blinding light and there's a famous picture of this blinding light that somebody painted he falls off a horse it's it's God saying Saul Saul why do you persecute me he changes his name to Paul and at that moment he converts and begins to follow Jesus and he spends the rest of his life not persecuting the church but telling everybody about Jesus and starting churches he started taking missionary journeys and you and I think of a missionary journey we think of like one place and then maybe back but not for Paul Paul spent his entire life on a missionary journey by foot here's Paul's first missionary journey you can see he traveled quite a ways here's Paul's second missionary journey again traveled even further here's Paul's third missionary journey Paul's entire life he spent going from place to place city to city telling people about Jesus converting people to Jesus he started these churches and houses with these people and then he would leave and say start telling other people about Jesus and he would write them notes and letters and Paul ended up of the 27 books In the New Testament, he wrote 13 of them, which are letters to churches. And one of the churches that he struggled with the most in all these journeys was a place called Corinth, or the book of Corinthians. And this is Corinth. Corinth is in Greece. It's across from uh, Athens. It sits on Isthmus. It's a very important city. We have a couple pictures of where it's located. Through Corinth, it connects two seas. There's a straight little narrow waterway. So all of the trade in this country goes through this town and this city. It becomes a very populated city. We have a couple other pictures of it. It comes extremely wealthy, about half a million people. And there's all sorts of people that travel through it. Millions go through it a year. There are ideas and teachers and all sorts of beautiful architects. 
and architecture that exists there and all sorts of temples to all kinds of gods. One of them, a very famous one, to the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who was a goddess of love and temple prostitutes, and that left all sorts of problems. And Paul began to write to this church and address all the issues this wealthy cosmopolitan city this church was having, how to treat people, how to deal with people. So the book of First and Second Corinthians are just his notes his letters to the church. We don't see what the church wrote him, just what he writes back. And by chapter um, 11 and 12, he writes to them, and he's been dealing with all sorts of issues, and he's writing to them about super (laughs) apostles. He actually says in chapter 11, I do not think I am at least inferior to those super apostles. That's in the Bible. Yeah, what is going on here? Well, what was going on was there was a group of people that went through and came through this place, Corinth, and they were teaching, and they began to brag about themselves, and people began to follow them, and they began to put down Paul and said, well, Paul didn't do this. Paul didn't study here. Paul doesn't look like this. Paul doesn't talk this way. And so Paul addresses this issue, and he begins to defend himself in chapter 11. He said, okay, about these super apostles, here's what I've done. And he gets to chapter 12, right around where our text is, and he's still continuing to defend himself, and he says this, If I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. You can tell he's tired of this already. I will go on to visions and revelations. He said, you want to boast about something? Brag about what God has shown you or taught you. He said, I know a man. Really, Paul? This is his way of saying, um, just asking for a friend. Anyone? Paul's talking about himself. I know a man, every scholar that you read who talks about this said, this is Paul's way of saying, this is me, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. What? Have you ever read something in the scripture and go, that's strange? Guess I'm going to just keep reading. How do you deal with this? What is Paul talking about? To understand what Paul is saying, um, You have to understand ancient cosmology, how the ancients understood how the world worked in heaven and hell, how it all sort of fits together. And the best way to describe it is this picture here. They thought of earth as like a dome, an egg. Think of it like that. So the earth is there. We're on this earth. And underneath the egg or earth is Sheol, where your body or soul would go to rest. And underneath that, underneath the pillars of that, is actually a a firmament of water. And then they said, above the earth is the first heaven. It's where the sun and the moon and the stars rested. Then the ancients said, above that is the second heaven, where the waters, or the firmament of waters were. This is why in the creation narrative and in uh, the flood narrative, the, the waters come from the sky, but also from underneath the ground and circle the earth. Then finally, there's the third heaven. Above all of that is where God And the angels and the heavenly host rested. And this was the most sacred and holy of all places. Few, if any, had ever experienced the third heaven. And if you did, you didn't dare talk about it or speak about it or write about it. Even the prophets that wrote about it would say it was like this or it was like this. They never actually used language to fully describe it because they knew it would profane the holiness of holy places. And Paul says, I was there. And the text keeps on going, and he said, I was caught up to this paradise. I heard inexpressible things, things that no one's permitted to tell. I'll boast about a man like that, but I won't boast about myself except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain so So no one thinking more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. He said, I'm not going to brag, but I've been to the third heaven. Take that, super apostles. And that's what he's talking about with this group of people. I don't want to brag about this, but I've seen and and heard things that no one else has. And then it goes on. And we get sort of to the crux of the situation. He says, therefore, because I've seen all this, in order to keep me from being conceited, 
I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So in order from being conceited from what he knew and saw, he had a thorn from the accuser that was in his flesh. Now there's a lot of debate. What is this thorn? What, do you, what, 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 what was it that happened to him? And when you look up the Greek word for thorn, it literally translates thorn. So you, you don't get very far with it. And it could be a lot of different things. It could have been emotional. He could have struggled with something mental like anxiety or depression. Could have struggled with anger or lust. It could have been physical. Could have been a pain. But what we do know was that it was unpleasant. And he didn't want it. It tormented him every single day. And so he prays and he prays and he prays and he prays. And he said, Lord, take this thing from me. And God doesn't answer. This holy, righteous person who travels the world telling people about Jesus prays and prays and prays and says, Lord, take this thing. And God, again, doesn't answer. But then Jesus intersects and comes and he teaches Paul a very simple truth. It's a truth for us. Because the next line, Paul says, but then he said to me, he being Jesus, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. He comes to Paul. Is he miraculously healed? No. Is the pain still there? Yes. Does he still struggle? Yes. But he comes and Jesus says, Paul, here's what I want you to know. My grace is. It's sufficient for you. And you have to be careful with this because I have heard people say grace is something like a, a pill given to Paul. He takes it and all of a sudden he can, he can withstand this thorn in his flesh. But that's not exactly what the Greek says because if you translate the Greek word for word, it literally says this in English. Enough for you is the grace of me. It's like the greatest Yoda saying ever. Enough for you, grace of me. Something like that. <laughs> Enough for you is the grace of me. He doesn't say, Paul, I'm giving you power. I'm giving you strength. He's saying, Paul, I am the power. I'm the strength. I'm the forgiveness. I'm the forbearance. I'm the hope. I'm the love. If we could simplify it, what he's telling Paul is this simple statement. I am all that you need, Paul. No matter what you're going through, no matter how I answer or don't answer, you need to remember this truth. I am all that you need. And Paul lived with this truth. In fact, Paul embodied this truth. In fact, I would argue that Paul, in some ways, lived with a different posture the rest of his life. Fourteen years ago, the beginning of his ministry, Jesus comes and teaches Paul this valuable truth. When I don't answer, remember this. I'm all you need. And Paul lived that way. And it's amazing to listen to Paul's own words and what he described he went through and was able to continue to go through in chapter 11 he's defending himself he says this i have worked much harder i've been in prison more frequently been flogged more severely have been exposed to death again and again five times i received from the jews 40 lashes minus one three times i was beaten with rod once i was pelted with stones three times i was shipwrecked i spent a night and day on the open sea stay off the boat man i have been constantly on the move i've been in danger from rivers danger from bandits and danger of my fellow jews danger from gentiles danger in the city danger in the country danger at sea danger from false believers i have labored and toiled gone without sleep i have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food i have been cold and naked and you're thinking yeah paul but did you die jeez How's a guy go through all that? How's a guy persevere 
and spend his life traveling, going through all this, I would argue that Paul understood and lived with a different posture. He knew that despite whatever happened to him, whatever happened to his prayers, however they were answered, he knew this simple truth. Christ was all he needed. Life may be hard. I may be hurt. It may not be fair. I may not get the answers I want, but I know this. The creator of the universe who holds everything in his hands, holds it all together, loves me, knows me, and promises to be right here with me for the rest of this life and for eternity. And that's all I need. And with that mindset, Paul lived different and could endure and live and spread God's word throughout the world. Christ was all that he needed when God didn't answer. Which leads us to a very simple question we have to ask ourselves. Is Christ all that you need? Is he all that I need? When things don't go our way, when we don't win, when we pray and God doesn't seem to answer, can we say, okay, it's not what I want, but Christ is all I need. I think, I think it's easy sometimes to say, oh yeah, Christ is all we need. We have that song, you know, you're all I want, you're all I need. But it's hard to live this out. And there's a lot of reasons why it's so hard to live this out. One of them is just because it's so countercultural. I mean, we live in a culture where we can get anything we want. You know, I know this. Um, have you ever heard of this website? It's called uh, Amazon. It's just this little website. You can buy anything you want at Amazon. You know, I know this. I got sucked down a rabbit hole looking at some of the most random things I could find, and I ended up finding this, the dog wig. Apparently, there are people who <laughs> like to put wigs on their dogs. And there's not more, there's not just one seller, there's, there's more than one seller. And once you add this to your cart, which I did, Amazon said people who bought this also recommended the cat bow tie. And I'm like, now you're just messing with me. We live in a place where I can get whatever I want, including a wig for a dog, at the click of one button and get it shipped to me in less than two days. And if it comes late, I complain. Unlike any other time in history, anything I want, whenever I want. And you don't think that affects us? What happens when we pray and God doesn't answer and we're used to getting everything we want? We get mad. We get frustrated. We get upset at God. We start to question him. Why did you do this? Why this? 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 Not even considering it. Perhaps the thing we ask for isn't the best thing for us. But when we're so used to getting everything I want and God doesn't answer, it's easy then just to blame God. And in fact, it could go as far as just leaving the faith altogether because we get upset at him. Is Christ all you need? Sometimes that's hard to live out because it's so countercultural. Sometimes it's hard to live out because of our own faith traditions. The things we were brought up in. Some of us have been brought up in what I would call a gospel of transactions. Where if I do X, Y, and Z, I do these things, then God will be happy with me over here and he will answer me and make sure nothing happens to me. If I read and I pray and I give and I go to church, then God will guarantee, okay, I, okay, this won't happen and I'll answer and you'll, things will be good. And that is just a transaction. I do this, God does this for me. That's not the gospel. The gospel is a relationship. And then when you pray, what happens when you've sort of been brought up in this faith tradition where you think you need to do these things and then God doesn't, what happens? We don't get mad at God. It's easy then to look instead at ourselves. We can deal with shame and we can deal with guilt. And say, man, did, did I not pray enough? Did I not read enough? Should I have spent more time? I knew I shouldn't have ran that red light. Is that why God didn't answer me? I had a friend named Wayne who I went to seminary with and told me his story. His mom got sick when he was young, and his faith community told him if he had enough faith and prayed, his mom would be healed, and she died. 
And for years, Wayne, he blamed himself. Like he did something wrong. Like it was his fault. Sometimes this idea, Christ is all I need, is difficult because our own faith traditions have taught us the opposite. That we need to make sure we do this, this, and this, and then God will give us what we want. And when God doesn't answer the way we want, it's hard for us not to blame and feel guilty about our lives. And it's hard for us to believe Christ is all we need because we think he's upset at us. And sometimes it's hard to believe this and live this truth out. Christ is all I need it's just because our own pride. Because this position to say, all right, Christ is all I need. He may not answer means I have to accept the fact I didn't get what I want. I have to admit, okay, it didn't work out. There was no miracle. I didn't get the things I need. I have to actually show that things aren't okay in my life. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've dealt with people who've let problems go on forever because they didn't want anyone to know or find out they were struggling because they thought everybody else had it together. And see, it, it takes a lot of humility to say, okay, Christ, you didn't answer me. Things aren't going well. Okay, maybe the things I asked for, maybe I, d I don't need them. You're, you're the only thing I need. See, that position takes a lot of humility. See, when God is not answering our prayer, Jesus invites us to live in a new way. Where we don't get angry when it doesn't go our way, where we don't blame ourselves as if we didn't pray right or we didn't do something right, we don't feel guilty, and we're humble enough to say it's not exactly everything I wanted. This mindset is hard because it's countercultural. It's counter-religion. It's counter like your own impulses. But it's in this mindset that we think, okay, it's so hard. Why would Jesus ask Paul? Why would Jesus ask us and say, okay, when God doesn't answer, just realize Christ is the only thing you need. Why would he ask us to live this way? And the truth is found in the second half of this verse. Because that's where God's power resides. Because he says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And then he said, my power is made perfect in weakness. And so he finishes and he says, Paul, remember this. My power is made perfect in weakness. And the word perfect here is the word teleos. And teleos doesn't mean it's faultless when we think of purpose. It's where we get the word telescope. It means to fully extend. So what Jesus is saying is, remember this, Paul, that my power is at its fullest when you are your humblest. When you're able to admit, okay, it didn't work out. It's not exactly what I thought or wanted. When we're able to simply say, okay, God, here it is. You're all I need, whatever you want. Then we can allow Christ to work through us. His love can work through us and change the world around us. And if you look at Paul, he changes the world with this posture. And we can, too, because God can use our lives and that attitude and that mindset to work through and bring his love to the people and the world around us. I think of my friend Ron. There's a picture of Ron. He passed away a couple years ago. But about 40 years ago, he found himself in Guatemala, and he has no money. He's lost everything he owns. He's at his lowest point. He doesn't know Spanish, doesn't know the local Mayan dialect called Quiche. He doesn't have anything, no way to even get home. And he's seeing this town, which is dirty. It's struggling and poor, and there's no hope. And there's these kids who are starving. And he begins to pray and said, God, this isn't right. And he prays more, and he said, I don't have anything, God, but something needs to be done. And through Ron... God begins to work, and Ron begins to pray more and more. 
And eventually, Ron started something called Pray America, a little organization that feeds thousands of kids a week so they don't go hungry. And then Ron started building houses, and they built houses for widows. And they say, this house is from Jesus. Take it. He loves you. And then he decided to build a shoe factory where kids can take trash from the area, turn it in, and Ron gives them shoes. And the reason they need shoes is because they need shoes to be able to go to school, and the shoes are free so kids can get education to try to get out of poverty. He also started a dental clinic in this place, and he flies dentists down. So all these people, if you're in the town, have, like, the greatest teeth. (laughs) It's hilarious. And then he started something called Sarah's Home, where the kids with disabilities are often discarded and left along the mountainside because they're thought to be cursed from God. And Ron picks all these kids up and takes them into a house and brings parents to be surrogate parents of these homes so that kids who are not loved understand what it's like to be loved. And if you ever had sat down with Ron and asked him how he did it, he said, I said, well, how do you, what about this and money? And how do you, he said, oh, we just prayed. It's like, no, you got to have that. No, really, I just prayed. What if God didn't answer? Well, we just sort of kept going and we did what we could. Ron lived this posture. Christ is all I need. And through that weakness, God's power changed a small city that is now beaming with hope and love. Power is made perfect in his weakness. Is Christ all that we need? See, it's in the times when we need God to answer. When we pray and we are weak, that's the key point in your life. You can get mad. You think you did something wrong. You can feel embarrassed. You don't want to show weakness. Or you can live different. You can admit a simple truth. I can't do much, but I do believe Christ is all I need. Are you humble enough to say that? even in the midst of a struggle, because if you are, it's in that mindset, that posture, that God can use you for something truly amazing. Jesus invites us to a completely different mindset when our prayers aren't answered, when we don't get what we want. Jesus invites us to say, Christ, it's all I need. It's an invitation to trust. It's an invitation to live in a way that says, I don't know what's going to happen. But I know the creator of the universe will be with me, and I'll be all right. It's an invitation then for Jesus to work through us, change the world around us for the better. If we're willing to say, when God doesn't answer, you know what? Christ is all I need in this. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this truth this intersection that you teach us, that even in the midst of some of the most difficult things, you truly are what we need. For any of us going through a struggle, any of us going through times where God doesn't seem to be answering, and we're struggling with all sorts of emotions, I pray that you intersect. You answer and you calm our nerves and our emotions. You show us your love and wrap your arms around us. Help us be humble enough to say, you're everything that I need. And help us live our lives and use our lives to make the world around us a better place. We pray this in Christ's name and everyone says, amen. So maybe this morning you're frustrated. Maybe you've been praying a prayer for a long, long time and God hasn't answered it. Or maybe you're just in a hard, hard and difficult season in your life and you're wondering, where is God in this? When you look at the Bible character Paul, we can see someone who um, went through a lot of trials, hardships, tribulations, and suffered immensely. And we can see his response. He says that he rejoiced in those hardships and in those hard seasons because I think Paul understood that in those seasons where he just couldn't go on, he had nothing left, that he had to surrender and completely give it over to God. And he knew that God could do far greater things through him than Paul could do on his own. And so I just want to challenge you this morning. Um, 
that those hard seasons are really tough and they're really difficult, but, but God is still there with you. And I just encourage you just to press into him and just to be looking for the ways that he is working in those situations and to know that, and take comfort in knowing that he will not leave you in that spot. And, and to know too that he's probably using this situation for something to further his kingdom here on earth and just trust him with it. So as you go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you have a prayer request this morning or you'd like to pray with somebody, you can text the keyword Foundry online to 94000 and press the number three key. Um, that's all I have for you this morning. And I just wanted to thank you for worshiping with us. And hopefully you're recovered um, after the 4th of July weekend last weekend and all of the fireworks and the maybe late nights. There were a lot of fireworks. Um, but hopefully you have a great day today, just enjoying the day. And uh, we look forward to worshiping with you again next week. Have a great week, everyone.